Not all SUVs are created equal, that much is obvious. But sometimes it's about more than market position or size. Sometimes it's about the very essence of the vehicle itself. Now that doesn't always mean there's some sort of wow factor that hits you over the head. Instead, it's about the sum of its parts that add up to excellence. And that's exactly how I'd describe the 2024 Toyota Grand Highlander Hybrid Max, an SUV that exists on one hand as a sort of unassuming appliance intent on making family life as easy as possible, and at the same time, it exists as one of the best family haulers like it. don't forget to share our channel and subscribe so you can catch some of this and maybe even a little of that. So the secret to the success of this particular version of the Grand Highlander is it takes all the best parts of Toyota's new three row and adds a very impressive powertrain. Now, it uses the same 2.4 liter turbocharged four cylinder as the gas only version, but it adds a couple different electric motors as well as a small battery pack. The result is 362 horsepower and 400 pound-feet of torque. Both of those numbers are more than just about any other mainstream SUV this size. The only one I can think of is the Ford Explorer ST, but that's really more of a proper performance SUV. What makes this even more impressive is the fact that it's a hybrid, not to mention it's just very docile and easy to get along with, easy to understand. That's what you want in a family hauler like this, but when you need a little bit of a kick, it'll give it to you. And it sounds pretty good doing it. Right now I have this thing in eco mode and it still just has that really hearty sound and it matches well with proper pickup. If you're going to merge or accelerate to pass someone on the highway, it doesn't feel sluggish the way you would expect a hybrid to. And that's because it's this hybrid max powertrain. That turbo motor really helps. Now, just like the conventional hybrid, there is a separate electric motor in the back that gives this thing all wheel drive. My only real complaint about this powertrain, the transmission, it is a six speed automatic, a conventionally geared unit, but sometimes it feels a lot more like a CVT. Not when you really get your foot into it, but just every once in a while when you're accelerating, it kind of has that endless acceleration, that rubber band effect that you get with a continuously variable transmission. I don't love that but pretty much everything else is absolutely perfect. Honestly, the big surprise for me so far during this week-long test has been the fuel economy. It's not been very good, at least according to this trip computer. Now, just so you guys know, I do reset absolutely every parameter when I start every test that I do. I just like to kick off fresh, make sure I am getting the most accurate number possible. So that's what I did when I picked up this Toyota. And I noticed pretty shortly after I left Toyota's headquarters that it was showing 10.9 liters per 100 kilometers. Now, it is winter time. That's not totally surprising. And quite often it takes a while to kind of settle into a normal consumption range. So I was driving along. I got about 150 kilometers into my drive and I checked again and it was still at 10.9. Now I was a little bit suspicious because the fact that the number hadn't changed, or at least it was the same number that I saw earlier, was a little odd, but I was starting to get worried that this thing wasn't as efficient as it's supposed to be because officially it's rated to burn 8.8 .8 liters per 100, which is about a liter and a half or so worse than the conventional hybrid version, but still very, very good. 10.9, that's a little bit worse than the gas only version. So I was suspicious, but also a little bit concerned, but I ran a manual calculation when I filled up this morning before this shoot, and I'm burning 8.74 liters per 100 kilometers, so actually slightly less than its official combined average. So nothing to worry about except for this wonky trip computer. Now that could be one of those first year gremlins that often pops up when a vehicle is new, but it 
can be a little troubling. I'd be a little upset if I bought a brand new vehicle and looked down at the computer to see way more fuel being burned than I thought. And let's be honest, not many people actually run those manual calculations. So hopefully Toyota can reflash these systems, make sure that they are displaying properly so you don't get a bunch of panicked Grand Highlander owners out there. But rest assured, this thing does look like it's right in the ballpark of its official rating, even with these cold temperatures that we're dealing with this week. Anyway, other than that kind of weird quirk, this drive experience, it's nice and mellow. This suspension is super smooth, soaks up bumps in the road very nicely. And just overall, it's kind of easy to forget how much sheet metal you are hauling around behind you. Now, no, I don't think you're gonna absentmindedly rip off the back half of this thing in a drive-through because you forgot how big it is, but it definitely drives like a much smaller SUV. And that is a very big benefit. This thing doesn't just drive like a smaller vehicle like the Toyota RAV4. It sort of looks like one too. And I think the angular aesthetic works really well with these larger proportions. It gives a good parking lot presence, even in an understated paint color like this Coastal Cream. And the whole reason the Grand Highlander exists, it's to make up for what the regular Highlander lacks and that is space inside. It's six inches longer overall and the wheelbase has been stretched four inches. Now, neither of those numbers is especially substantial, but they do give this thing some good space inside. They really make it what the current version of the regular Highlander should have been when it was introduced four years ago. Now, when you take a peek behind this power tailgate, you'll notice there's a good amount of cargo room with the third row in place, and that is definitely not the case in the Highlander. I will say, though, this third row, it's more cramped than you might be expecting. I'm telling you right now, if you need a fully functioning third row of seats, I would highly recommend checking out the Toyota Sienna. But as far as SUVs go, this thing does a decent job of keeping up with the competition. There really is an emphasis on practicality in here that I love, especially in a family first machine. So you've got strategically placed USB-C ports in all three rows of seating. There's also cubbies, cup holders, and shelves just about everywhere. You can remove this center console between the second row captain's chairs. That's another one of those cool features. So if you want to use it as a walkthrough so your kids can get to the third row, no problem. But if you want to give the people in the second row the cup holders and places to put their phones, they can do that too. Very handy. Some stuff I don't like in here, all of this kind of dull black plastic around the window switches, these climate controls down here on the console, it looks and feels very cheap, very out of place in a vehicle that comes this close to $70,000 before tax. And then it looks even worse against this brown upholstery. That's really nice, but this stuff, it does not match well with it at all. And I know I usually complain about gloss black plastic. There's just a bit of it in here, down here around this gear selector as well as around the touchscreen. But honestly, I would rather see that than this really scratchy, cheap feeling stuff. I also like this gold trim that you get in here. It's very nice. And again, it plays well with the brown, but one point that I don't like, Toyota went ahead and stuck these silver door handles in silver vent controls. That mismatch just does not make sense to me. Attention to detail matters. And when you want to charge this much money for a vehicle, well, the expectations elevate with the price. I really think Toyota's designers miss the mark. I know those are small points of contention, but they are points of contention nonetheless. Now, other than that, this space, eh, it's pleasant enough. It's got just about all of the features you could want in a vehicle that's this expensive. Now, a couple points. The regular Highlander, you can't get all the features you get here. So it really does feel like Toyota kind of elevated what it's offering here to keep up with the competition. So you get heated and ventilated front and second row seats. Of course, a heated steering wheel, this big 12.3 inch touchscreen. It's got a built-in Wi-Fi hotspot, wireless Apple CarPlay and Android Auto connections. There's a head-up display. I'm telling you, this thing is decked out. I will point out one sort of unique quirk here. 
if you have your phone connected wirelessly to the Apple CarPlay, the Wi-Fi hotspot cannot be enabled. I don't know what the logic is behind that, but for whatever reason, with the Wi-Fi hotspot enabled, you cannot enable wireless phone connections. It has something to do with the fact that you need Wi-Fi to connect wirelessly to the Apple CarPlay system. But again, it's just something to keep in mind that that convenience does get lost. But if it means the kids are happy streaming in the back seat while you're on your way to the cottage, well, that to me is a worthy sacrifice. Now, there are also all kinds of advanced driver assistance and safety systems. The usual stuff like lane keep assist, forward collision warning with pedestrian and cyclist detection. There's a front and rear cross traffic alert system. That's pretty cool to see blind spot monitoring. The full kit and caboodle. One I don't love though, this proactive driving assist system that I first experienced in the Toyota Crown sedan. Now on the surface, it does seem pretty cool. It kind of works like adaptive cruise control without adaptive cruise engaged. So when you have it on, if the vehicle in front of you starts to slow down, this thing will start to slow down to match that. That is kind of handy because if you're not paying full attention, well, it is nice that the computer kicks in to have your back, but here is the problem. It stops working at about 20 kilometers an hour. So anything slower than that, you have to take over the braking. Now, it's like I always say, you should not rely on these systems entirely. You should always be ready to take over, but I do think it's a bit disconcerting. The fact that it'll slow down for you, but then you have to jump in kind of towards the end. Don't love that. But the good news is you can turn that system off and just about any of the rest of them through this instrument display. You do have to do most of it when you are stopped. Again, safety first, but it's cool that you can adjust them, adjust the sensitivity of that system or disable it entirely through the settings in the instrument display. Otherwise, this thing's got you covered for family life and then some. No, I don't think it is absolutely perfect but really no vehicle is. And there's no real standout feature here. There's no one thing that I go, wow, this is what elevates the experience. But again, it's the sum of its parts. It's the way that it all comes together that really makes this thing as good as just about any of the other top picks in the segment. I really think if you are shopping for a three row SUV, this one should be the first you test drive. To recap, I like how well suited this powertrain is to the size of the Grand Highlander, as well as the class competitive space you get with it and the practical touches inside. I don't like the cheap looking plastics in the interior and that it's expensive, but that's about it. Okay, so absolute perfection eludes the Toyota Grand Highlander, but I'd say it comes as close as any of the top picks in the segment, especially with this hybrid max powertrain. Now it is expensive at over 67 grand before tax and not all of the materials inside jive with that price tag, but taken as a whole, this thing is easily one of the best entries this size on the market. I still say you should check out the Sienna if you really need a family hauler, but if you have your heart set on a three row SUV, you can't do much better than this.